we are live now you can start with it. okay so hello namaste and good evening this is mega and on behalf of four optum i welcome you all on this four optum e learning session this session is initiated by four optum it is an interactive program where we discuss optometry topics this session is live on youtube and if you have any queries you can type them out on conversation box we will discuss about after the presentation so today we have with us mr sankhadeep roy who will be speaking on the topic oct step by step interpretation a brief introduction to our speaker here mr sankhadeep roy is a graduated in optometry and currently he is a consultant optometrist and faculty at nandadeep school of optometry unit of nandadeep eye hospital he is specialized in ocular electrophysiology and electro ocular diagnostics and handling the same department in nandadeep eye hospital so on behalf of four optum i welcome you sir over to you hey, thank you mega for a wonderful introduction uh, before proceeding i would also like to thank the four optum e learning team for providing this wonderful platform to deliver my talk so in this session i'll be talking about the practical applications of optical coherence tomography and its step by step clinical approach we all know that the optical coherence tomography has evolved over the past few decades as one of the most important diagnostic tool and has revolutionized the clinical practice of ophthalmology not only it helps us to understand the structural changes in the retina and the optic nerve but also helps us to understand the morphological structures of the anterior segment so since ocd is a vast topic to be discussed in one session so today i'll be talking about the retinal ocd only and the step by step analysis So optical coherence tomography is an imaging technique that utilizes low coherence light waves to capture cross sectional images of the retina. So as the term suggests, optical means it is related to the property of light that uses low coherence interferometry to visualize the histological structures of the retina. So let's see what are the key features of an OCT has. So OCT being a non-contact non-invasive procedure, it performs cross section cross sectional high resolution imaging of the biological tissues and also it measures the time delay and amplitude of the back scattered light so the aim of oct technology is to perform a real time direct visualization of the histological structures of the retina so talking about the key features since ocd is a non invasive imaging technique so it provides in vivo images without actually impacting the tissue that is imaged so it typically uses the light in the near infrared spectral range of around 810 to 840 nanometer and has a penetration depth of several hundred microns in tissues moreover fast scanning rates and quick signal acquisition also allows image visualization in real time frames so currently the resolution of octs are much more higher than other medical imaging methods like ultrasound or mri because actually it combines an actual actual resolution that can reach that of confocal microscopy with lateral resolution comparable to confocal scanning laser ophthalmoscopy so typically you can understand that ocd systems have a resolution that ranges from 20 microns to 5 microns so let us know how does an ocd works so optical coherence tomography is actually based on michelson interferometer principle so here in this image you can see that there is a light source a uh, beam splitter a uh, reference mirror a sample size or a retinal area of interest you can say or a photodetector so what the michelson interferometer principle does is that it actually uses a beam splitter which is this one where a light source is split into two arms one at this side one at that side and each of this light is reflected back towards the beam splitter which then combines the amplitude and the resultant interference pattern is actually directed towards the photodetector in the form of image for analysis so basically you can see that the resultant waveform which is formed has a larger magnitude as compared to the incident waveform so what happens here is that inter uh, interference so this particular waveform is said to be in phase so this is the core optics on which the ocd works so in the first generation and the second generation ocds which are the time domain ocd and the fourier domain ocd both the ocds have the same optics but with the Slight modifications. 
So later in newer technologies of OCTs, new technologies have been incorporated for better visualization of the structures. So in 1991, when there was lack of alternative diagnostic tools for depth resolved assessment of the retina, OCT became the commercially available ophthalmic imaging device. So in 1991, the first generation OCT that evolved was a time domain OCT, as I said, which actually had a movable reference mirror. And it actually requires acquisition of depth scan for every location. So it offers a very slow imaging speed and poor quality images. So the usability and noisy images on clinical diagnosis actually created limitations in modern practice. So to solve this problem, the second generation OCDs, that is the Fourier domain OCDs evolved and which had a fixed reference mirror. And it was able to overcome the limitations by providing good quality and uh, images and scanning speed, which are being able to capture the whole depth information simultaneously. So in this picture, you can easily see that this particular OCT, which is the Fourier domain OCT, is much more clear and sharper as compared to this time domain OCT, because you can see there are a lot of noise. So if there was a small lesion, it would be difficult for this time domain OCT to capture. At the same time, since the reference mirror was movable, so it was able to capture a single image at a single time. So it was a very time-bound test. Now, this picture shows the color coding in a colored OCT image. We all know that the retina consists of 10 layers. So this is the outer part of the retina and this is the inner part of the retina. So from outward to inward, all the 10 layers are as the retinal pigment epithelium, the photoreceptor layer or the layers of rods and cones, the external limiting membrane, the outer nuclear layer, the outer plexiform layer, the inner nuclear layer, the inner plexiform layer, ganglion cell layer, retinal nerve fiber layer, and the inner limiting membrane. So here in this coding, you can see that this area, which is a red broad line, this indicates the retinal pigment epithelium, which is actually the last extension of the choroid. Above that, this particular area, which is actually a combination of red and yellowish color, and also which is present here. So this particular area indicates the photoreceptor layer, and this area indicates the retinal nerve fiber layer. Besides this, there are different reflectance of green. So you can see there are hyperreflective green areas, which indicates the limiting layer, the plexiform layer, and the ganglion cell layer. Whereas the hyperreflective green areas it, uh, actually consist of nuclear layer. So the thumb rule to remember is that all nuclear layers are hyperreflective in nature, and all plexiform layers are hyperreflective in nature. Besides that, you can see there is other areas which is this, which is around, I think, bluish black in color or an empty space. Same present beneath the uh, retina is the, this area, which is the choroid area. So in a colored OCT image, a vitreous board cavity or a choroid looks to be bluish black or empty space. Now, in this picture, you can see that there are three different representations of OCT images. And all these images are utilized in modern day clinical practice. So what I have found in my practice is that grayscale report provides better visualization of structural details than conventional colored OCT images. Even there is a study done, which was published in the British Journal of Ophthalmology, where the statistical analysis showed that the grayscale images proved to be significantly better in visualizing the details of epiretinal membrane, photoreceptor data layers, and retinal pigment epithelial layer morphology as compared to color scale images, which actually created false impression on photoreceptor disruption. So uh, I have provided the citation of the study. If anybody wants to look for that, you may look it later. So this is a grayscale representation of a normal OCT. In this case, the reflectance is very important. Here in this part, you can see that the reflective area, the most reflective area is the retinal pigment epithelium followed by the photoreceptor layer. So, in this grayscale OCT, we are able to easily distinguish the uh, photoreceptor layer from RPE. And same, you can easily see that there is a thin hyperreflective line passing through. This is the external limiting membrane. As I said in my earlier uh, slides, these hyperreflective areas indicate the nuclear layer, the outer and the inner nuclear layer, respectively. And the hyperreflective areas indicate the plexiform layers, outer and inner, respectively, followed by the ganglion cell layer. This hyperreflective area, broad area, this indicates a retinal nerve fiber layer with the inner limiting member at the top. 
also the most beneficial part of this grayscale ocd as compared to a colored ocd is that you are able to visualize the choroidal area much properly up to this area is the choroid after that sclera starts this particular area is called the choroidal sclera junction so let's see what are the different pathologies where ocd is indicated so broadly we divide the retina into three parts the superficial part the inner retina which is the deep retinal part and the outer retinal part so based upon that we divide it the pathologies so what are the superficial pathologies that can be uh, detected from the ocd in the superficial pathology it may have fractions it may have membranes it may have macular holes in the deep retinal layers you may have macular edema you may, you may have sciences of separation of the layers or exudative changes and also in the outer retinal areas you may have epithelial detachments atrophies or rp irregularities so this slide is the most important slide of the entire session so in order to analyze the ocd report we need to answer all the four questions so this, if any ocd report comes to your hand if you can answer all these four questions then making a clinical finding is very easy and obviously making a clinical findings will lead to a diagnosis so we assume that this is a normal ocd so the first point which you need to remember is that how does the vr interface appear so vr interface is basically the vitreo retina interface which is basically the connection of the posterior vitreous cortex of the vitreous body with internal limiting membrane of the retina so next point is how does the foveal contour looks like so here you can see this particular v shaped portion is the foveal contour anything except from this is abnormal the third point is is the inner retinal architecture altered so if is the is there any changes in the inner retinal layers if there is a change apart from this there is abnormality and the last point is whether the uniformity of rpecc complex is disrupted means whether the outer retina is disrupted or not based upon all these four points i'll be showing you few cases or examples where i'll be utilizing all these four points and show you how to lead to a clinical findings so let's go to the details one by one so we'll come to right now in the uh, vitreo retina interface so what may be the possibilities in a vitreo retina interface it may be normal as shown in the picture here it may have a membranous changes which may be in the form of single or double it may have attachment it may have no attachment it may have a partial attachment or it may have complete attachment so let's see what are the key retinal pathologies that can be detected in a vitreo retina interface through an oct So, if there is a posterior halide separation, if there is a membranous trans, if it, if there is a fractional uh, detachments, if there is macular holes, it can be easily detected through an OCT in the vitreo retinal interface area. So, let's see this OCT report. So, what do you see there? We will analyze. We will uh, find out the clinical findings based upon all those four points. So, here we see that in the vit vitreo retinal interface area, there is a hyperreflective membrane. okay but the foveal contour appears to be absolutely normal there is no alteration of the foveal contour at the same time the inner retinal layer and the outer retina is intact so the report will be a partial separation of vitreous from retina without altering foveal contour with intact inner and outer retina so the, if you see this kind of case it may be possibility to be have a vitreo macular adhesion now in this case what do you see that there is thickening of the foveal contour the foveal contour is not at all a v shape there is a thickening at the same time there is a hyperreflective thick membrane above the inner limiting membrane but there is no disruption of the fovea so and also you can see that there are cystic spaces in the inner retina but the outer retina is intact so the oct will reveal that it has a elevated foveal contour following presence of thick intact hyperreflective membrane above the internal limiting membrane with few cystic changes in the inner retina and the rp which is the outer retina appears to be intact so in cases of cellophane maculopathy we can see this kind of pictures so basically if you don't do a diagnosis is okay but doing a clinical finding is very important because ocd is an additional test whatever findings we make if we make a diagnosis also in this to be recorded clinically 
But in maximum cases of telopan maculopathy, we see that this kind of picture. Now, this is a kind of a different picture, not the same picture as we have seen in the previous slide. Here, what we see is that we are we are seeing a elevated foveal contour, which is also thickened. At the same time, the foveal contour is disrupted. You can see this mild disruption. In the previous slide, if you see, there is no disruption here. But in this slide, you see there are mild disruptions in the foveal contour. At the same time, we have a thick hyperrespective membrane, and here actually the vitreous is kind of pulling the retina towards its uh, that's why the inner retina and the outer retina is a bit disrupted so if you see this kind of pictures it clearly indicates that this patient this might be a case of epiretinal membrane so here the oct is, shows elevated and disrupted foveal contour following presence of thick hyperreflective membrane above the internal limiting membrane with intact outer and uh, inner retina now this is a very common case that is found on a regular daily basis so here we see that the foveal contour is elevated by two double stranded membranes this this actually shows an indication that the vitreous is kind of pulling the retina towards its cells resulting in a for disruption of inner retinal areas so ocd uh, shows thick hyperreflective double stranded membranes in vitreous cavity attached to the fovea with disruption of foveal contour resulting in separation from inner retina the outer retina and the neurosensory retina so in this kind of case is very much common in uh, patients with vitreous macular traction so you can see by traction there is a tractional pull the vitreous is pulling the retina towards itself there is a pulling mechanism is happening besides vitreous retinal interface let's see what are the abnormalities we can find in a foveal contour area so a foveal contour may be normal it may be disrupted as i said it may have be widened because of foveal thinning it may have a hole in the form of complete or partial so here what we see the first thing is that the foveal contour is incomplete there is an absence of foveal contour you can see at the same time it is disrupted and there is a presence of thick hyperreflective membrane on the over the ilm but this absence is not complete it's incomplete so there is partial absence of foveal contour i also you can see there are few cystic changes in the inner retinal part but the outer retina appears to be intact so this ocd shows an abnormal foveal contour with thick hyperreflective membrane above the ilm and there is obviously partial absence of foveal contour along with microcystic spaces in the inner retina but the outer retina is intact so in conditions like inner lamellar macular hole which is a partial macular hole we see this kind of a pictures this is a very common picture we encounter many times in our diagnostic clinic so everybody see that there is complete absence of foveal contour you can see here this is totally separated from here and at the same time there are cystic spaces and there is complete separation of the neurosensory retina so neurosensory retina is those that parified uh, as i told that the retina consists of 10 layers so broadly retina is classified into two layers the retinal pigment epithelium which is the last extension of the choroid and the neurosensory retina which consists of nine layers so the entire neurosensory retina has been se completely separated from here only the rp is intact so the oct reveals that complete absence of foveal contour with separation of neurosensory retina from the rp so you see this kind of cases in patients with full thickness macular hole now let's come to the inner retinal architecture so it may be normal it may be it may have diffuse interretinal fluids it may have cystic spaces it may have exudative changes it may have cysts or separation so what are the key retinal pathologies that occurs in the inner retinal part so it's a detected through an oct you may have a macular edema you may have retinoschisis exudative changes and retinal vein occlusions secondary to macular edema So this is a very common picture that we are seeing here. So as you can see here, if we apply all those four points, the first point is that there is a elevation of foveal contour. At the same time, there are multiple large cystic spaces in the inner retinal area with outer retina being intact. So OCD shows elevated foveal contour with large cystic spaces in inner retinal layer with intact RP. So this is a typical clinical case of cystoid macular edema now what do you think this picture looks like 
does it look like the same it actually looks like the same but there is a bit twist here you see that there is a foveal elevation which is common in the previous slide but the inner retina is totally intact and there is a fluid accumulation between the rpe which is the outer retina and the neurosensory retina so in the previous slide what happens is that the rpe was intact the neurosensory retina was intact but there were cystic spaces hollow spaces in the form of cysts that occurs in the inner retinal layers so here the inner retina is totally intact whereas there is fluid accumulation between the rp and the neurosensory retina so this is a very typical case seen in patients with central serous chorioretinopathy or you know as central serous retinopathy csr or csr ocd shows elevated foveal contour with inner retinal layers accumulation of fluid between rp and neurosensory retina so now this is basically a combination of two pathologies now you have seen a macular edema how does a macular edema looks like in an ocd we have seen how does a csl looks in an ocd now see here here we see that there is a elevation of foveal contour at the same time there is cystic spaces large cystic spaces in the inner retinal layer and also we can see here a small area which is the neurosensory retina being slightly separated from the rpe so we don't call this area as a cs or a srf like here the fluid that accumulates is a subretinal fluid but here in this case we don't consider this particular position as a csr because a typical csr does not have any cystic spaces so we consider this area as a neurosensory detachment so in this particular ocd the report will say that there is elevation of the foveal contour followed by large cystic spaces in the inner retinal layers with a large neurosensory detachment as i said so this kind of cases are very much common in patients with retinal vein occlusion associated with macular edema now this is a very typical case a very rare case but sometimes you may find this in your clinic so here what do you see that the foveal contour is flattened as you can see there is no such is not elevated is doesn't have a proper v shaped contour is flattened at the same time you can see here the inner retina has been separated there is separation of the inner retinal layers so ocd shows that there is elevated flattened foveal contour with significant separation of inner inner nuclear layer from outer plexiform layer so this kind of case is very much common in patients with retinoschisis so term schisis means separation now here what do you see that the foveal contour is somehow elevated in this position but it grossly looks to be normal at the same time the inner retina has few microcystic spaces with a hyper reflective dotted spot with after shadow you can see this shadows this shadows occur because of this hyper reflective spots so ocd is not able to pass through it so it creates after shadows but the inner outer retina is intact so ocd shows grossly normal foveal contour with few cystic spaces with hyper reflective dotted spot with shadowing in the inner retinal layer rp appears to be intact so if there is a macular edema with exudative changes you will find this kind of images so let's come to the outer retinal part so how what are what would be the possible possibilities in a outer retinal area it may be normal it may have a bumpy elevations it may have thickening or it may be elevated So let's see here. Here we see that the foveal contour is looks to be normal. Even the inner retina also looks to be normal, but the outer retina appears to be irregular, disrupted, and you can see the lesion has deep encroached towards the choroidal area. So OCD shows grossly normal foveal contour with intact inner retina, defective junctional layer. So the photoreceptor layer is defected here. So we have one thing here which is called the ellipsoid zone or the is os junction so there is a defective is os junctional layer with irregularities in the uh, rp that has encroached deep into the choroid so if there is a chorioretinal atrophy you will see this kind of images now this is a typical case here what we see that this portion of the foveal contour is normal but this portion of the foveal contour is abnormal so is somewhat elevated 
towards nasal side as you can see that this slope is going down so this indicates that this is the right eye and this is the nasal side of the can so the nasal part of the foveal contour is somehow abnormal elevated and there is a dome shaped elevation here at the outer retinal portion at the same time there is an adjacent sub retinal fluid leakage and few cystic changes so in cases here you can see that ocd shows elevated foveal contour nasally with intact retinal retina significant dome shaped elevation with rp with adjacent sr leakage so if there is a pigmented epithelial detachment ped you may experience this kind of a images although there are different forms of pd there are serous pd hemorrhagic pd uh, so you can see different different uh, pd images so this is one classical pd images now here we see that the foveal contour appears to be normal even there is mild change here in the inner retina but at a gross it looks to be normal but here we see there are formation of lesions at the outer retina area with adjacent SRF leakage. You can see a leakage here, here, here. So there is a lesion formation which is above the RP with adjacent SRF leakage. So in patients with choroidal neovascular membrane, you may find this kind of images. Whether uh, it's a form of wet ARMD. So in different ARMD like in type one CNVM, type two CNVM, there are different types of CNVM like occult CNVM, Clarke CNVM. So you may find this kind of images. Although there are different types of uh, uh, choroidal neovascular membrane, I have just shown you one such example where there is an image above the art, uh, outer retinal level with adjacent SRF leakage. In patients with classic CNVM, we see this kind of images. So uh, this is a very important thing in the slide. So we can see that OCT report can be analyzed both qualitatively and quantitatively. Is very much important. Why is important? Because in this particular report, you can see that we are able to see the good quality scan. We can able to detect whether there is shadowing or reflectivity or not. At the same time, we can assess the thickness, the volume of the scan of the entire profile. We can see here the measurements. So through this, we can measure what is the subfoveal thickness, what is the foveal thickness. So it's very much important. So OCT provides a very good role in analyzing. The report both quantitatively and qualitatively. Now, this is a very much important. Although you have seen how to analyze the OCD report, but, but the main thing starts here. It's very much important how to acquire a perfect scan because if you miss a small lesion, then it will be difficult for a clinician to understand the actual problem and that will change the treatment modalities. So, here in this image, you can see that. The scan has passed through an area which is not an area of interest. It should have passed through this area. At the same time, you can see the scan which is showing has no such abnormalities. Same time, you see in this image, the scan is passing through an area of interest and is showing the adequate abnormalities shown here. Also, at the same time, proper focus is very much important. And if you should always explain the patient to avoid blinking. Sometimes you get a OCD result where the scan acquisition is perfect. You have located the proper area and you have acquired a scan, but scan quality is not good. It actually you need to see the signal strength index or the signal to noise ratio, which is very much important thing. Like in this scan, you can see there is a scan equation showing somewhat here is written 64. So this is the actual quality of the image. You can show, see here, quality of the image. So if the quality of the image, if the quality of the scan is very good, that will give us a good treatment modality. Also, you can see that the right scan will give you a right diagnosis. This is very important. You can see five scan, line scan has passed through our area. And each of the areas shows a different thing. But you see the first and the second scan, the area through which they have passed, they have missed this particular thing. If we would have not been passed through this particular area, we would have missed the large PED. So this is very much important to see whether the scan is passing through the proper area or not. Although OCT provides us a very good uh, diagnostic tool, but there are a few limitations. Like uh, in patients who have excessive eye movements, like in nystagmus cases, so it is very much difficult for a clinician to acquire an image. 
even if the patient has poor fixation or poor vision is very much important uh, very much tough it becomes very much tough to take images or acquire images in conditions where there is a hemorrhages or any other abnormalities like vitreous hemorrhages it is difficult to acquire uh, oct scan even if there is present of intraocular gases or if there is a dense media also acquiring a good quality oct scan is somehow sometimes become difficult okay now i'll like to talk about some newer versions of oct so here you can see that uh, the oct that you are seeing is basically a spectrometer based spectral domain oct so what so i have mentioned in my previous slide that a fourier domain oct uses the same principle as a michelson interferometer principle but it just have a fixed reference mirror then this spectral domain oct what they incorporated is that they introduce a spectrometer so is basically a spectrometer this spectral domain oct which was introduced by heidelberg engineering in the year 2006 and it was based on the heidelberg retina angiograph which is commonly known as hra so it actually does what it actually combines the optical coherence tomography with cslo reflectance the confocal scanning laser ophthalmoscopy reflectance in blue green and infrared wavelength range so it basically does what it actually throws three types of wavelengths of light as three different part of the retina the superficial the deep and the outer retina and captures all the informations so uh, this particular in, uh, type of oct they utilizes two different advanced modes the first mode is called the enhanced depth imaging or the edi mode so what it does is it modifies the standard technique of image acquisition to better reveal the structural details of the choroid you can see here we are easily able to understand the choroidal thickness at the same time there is an first oct method which actually provides the ab ability to pro precisely localize lesions with sub uh, specific subretinal layers using designated retinal landmarks so in the particular program we have few landmarks through which we can measure it like here you can see that a slab has been measured so through the enfas oct we can measure those slabs and go through and proceed for further diagnosis also enfas oct is known as t scan oct because it actually produces frontal sections of the retinal layers so one another such advancement in uh, oct is the swept source oct it is actually introduced in clinical practice in the year 2012 so it's very new and because of its deeper penetration using wavelength of approximately 1040 nanometer and faster scan acquisition time so swept source oct has the ability to visualize the choroid the vitreous and the retinal structures even if there is a dense preretinal hemorrhage also a swept source oct will able to visualize the structures moreover it has also contributed to the research of the vitreous body in fact this is the first ophthalmic diagnostic technology to demonstrate the entire structure of the posterior precortical vitreous pocket in vivo so i have uh, shared a link also if you wish to uh, see the uh, details of this you can see any time later so basically the major difference between a swept source oct and a spectral domain oct is that a spectral domain oct uses a superluminescent diode and has a broad wavelength light which is divided into spectrum through diffraction and then it does what it actually projects the spectrometer to achieve interference on the other hand the swept source oct uses a tunable laser where the light source is already divided into spectrum and thus it acquires high speed data acquisition which is twice as fast as compared to the spectral domain oct so this takes us to the end of the session so the points that we should keep in mind that ability understanding the location and type of scan to acquire is very much important also while taking the scan we should make the patient comfortable like in previous uh, technologically octs we need a patient to get dilated current oct doesn't need dilatation even a non mediatic oct can be achieved advances in oct technology provide for better understanding of pathogenesis also it improves monitoring of progression and also assist in quantifying response to treatment modalities and diseases of the posterior segment of the eye but still further improvements are going on in both hardware and software shape section and technology should further advance the clinician's ability to assess and manage choroidal diseases so oct always remember that oct is always an additional test it needs to be clinically uh, correlated clinically with fundus examination likewise fundus and close angiography and other 
between the diagnostic kit. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, sir. Indeed, it was a wonderful presentation. So we can move on to discussion session. Sure. Okay, so we have some few questions here. Uh, Mr. Soga Chakraborty has asked about basically, I think, NSD. Yeah, neurosensory detachment, basically. So uh, yeah, often there is a confusion that what I have told in my slide is that in a uh, central cerebral retinopathy, we found an accumulation of fluid between the RT and the neurosensory retina. So, which is basically subretinal fluid. Now, when we are considering a different test, different pathology, because a typical central serous retinopathy won't be having any such macular edema or any other pathology. Besides different pathologies or combination like macular edema associated with a SRF, looks to be a SRF. It is actually not an SRF. It is actually a neurosensory detachment. So linear sensory detachment actually uh, says that it is actually a separation from the RP from the neurosensory retina. Okay, I hope that questions uh, his answer. So again, he again only he is asking that what is CNVM? CNVM is basically a choroidal neovascular membrane. So what happens is that. Uh, when the choroid is very much important part for retina because from the choroidal capillary section, the choroid supplies nutrients and oxygen to the retina, mainly the uh, photoreceptor layer. So it sends the nutrients and the oxygen through the RP. So RP is actually working as a filter. So when there is uh, changes in the RP layers, maybe irregularities or alterations, or maybe dystrophies, so new vessels start to form. So this new vessels that forms from beneath the choroidal area, which is the choroidal capillary, the Brooks Newman complex, we see the say at RPCC complex, to results in formation of new vessels, which is called the choroidal new vascular membrane. So there are different forms of choroidal new vascular membrane. Like I said in the uh, slide that I showed, if, the, if there is a formation of lesion above the RP or beneath the RP, we need to see what are the adjacent extra uh, signs we are finding, like in a case of a classic CNVM, we find uh, lesions above the RP, but ha there has to be an adjacent SRF leakage. But sometimes there are uh, lesions which are beneath the RP when th there may be scarred CNVM, there are different types of CNVM. There may be a, com a combination of type 1 and type 2, which is for the RAP, which is the retinal angiomatosis proliferation. So there are certain kinds of things. We need to clinically correlate clinically based on the conditions. Oh. Okay, thank you, sir. Hope that answers his uh, question. So again, Mr. Pakun has asked about PED, how like PED will get detached and all. Can you please explain that? Yeah, basically, uh, PED in a OCT looks, you have to see PED is a problem in the outer retinal part. So it's a pigmented epithelial detachment. The, retin the re retinal pigment epithelium gets detached from the area. So it actually forms a dome-shaped area. You'll see a dome-shaped elevations at the outer retinal portion. So PED formation, it may be a secondary to a CSR if there is a constant recurrent CSR because current study says that CSR is no longer a pathology of the retina. It is actually a pathology from the choroidal portion. So if there are recurrence of the CSR, uh, CSR for longer time, it may sometimes form PED. Sometimes there might not be CSR, but there is formation of PED. It is basically oh, okay. a, a problem in the outer retinal layer, the RP, retinal pigment epithelium detachment. Okay, hope that answers this question. So we are now end of the question session. So we are also the end of the session. So before ending the session, I request you to share your feedback on this uh, e-learning session. Sure, absolutely. Thank you for providing us the opportunity. And I once again thank the entire forum team for providing us such a beautiful platform so that we could deliver our talk. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, sir, for your lovely words and your experience, valuable times you share with us today. I also thanks our audience to be so attentive and interactive on this session. 
So at last, I'd like to end the session. Stay tuned for more upcoming programs. Follow us at www.foroptom.com and also follow us on social media like WhatsApp, Instagram, and for op Facebook for getting updates of new upcoming programs and sessions. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Stay safe. Bye. Thank you so much.